Hello everyone, welcome to Prompt. I am, my name is Sahil Verma. I am a software developer working in the backend application and core development systems. Today we'll be having an interview and today we have Gautam with us. So let's get started with it. Uh, hi, so I'm Gautam and I'm a backend engineer. I have nearly four years of experience and I really like building out stuff. I am very interested in scaling out different components and I'm always into a lot of blogs about technical discussions. So, yeah, hi. Uh, one thing that really excites me about backend is that uh, you look at any application, like for example, Instagram, Facebook, all the application that you find in your phone, that application is very small. Uh, the utility that it provides is based on their backend, how efficient that backend is. So let's take the case of Uber. When you go to Uber and you see all the interface, you can easily create it within a week. But their infrastructure is so complicated, yet it delivers a lot of uh, functionality to the user, which is which is very uh, interesting. So. That's why I always like to explore more into backend. That is true. And then recently I was having a thought that, uh, you know, different components that we learn about it, it can be like, you know, programming paradigms or let's say multi-threading or even using out the different applications of database and something like that. Uh, the way the industry has changed now is that we have a few products which are necessary, which delivers like a complete value directly in your uh, client side right for example let's yeah. say photoshop but uh, systems like canva and those kind of things and majority of the market is changing into this complete uh, you know back end and front end client so yes that that actually plays so whatever the skills that we do learn i believe everything can be implemented in back end as well right yeah definitely you're right yeah. so uh I'm going to make it a system design interview. Let's see if it is going to be a low level or a high level design. So I want you to start uh, explaining what are the different components that you use to make sure that there is a fully functional uh, backend. Okay, yeah. Uh, I believe like that's a, that's a big list. So I, I, can, I can say it more in and like, so I can say it more in the kind of like the layers in which uh, I can go through. So I believe first layer is the one in which we do have our API gateways and uh, the load balancer and those kind of layers. So this one is more of that the one which interacts with your client. And in that I can say that you know uh, load balancers does come into the picture. Your API gateways comes into picture. Uh, rate limiters comes into the picture and the network rules comes into the picture. And after that, I can say that there is more of like a middle processing layer in which the configurators comes into the picture, the processing layer that you have for your functionality, uh, those comes into the picture. And then one side we can say about is the all of the databases and all of the data stores comes, uh, comes in. And one way we can say is like the monitoring part that that also plays a significant role and then the cold storage is parts as well so i believe like you know we have different components in all of those yes right. and then we can have like the you know the containerization platforms as well so the one you know you'll be passing out the yaml values and configurations and then making it into a uh, containers yeah so in simple terms these four are the only thing that are needed. There are things that are on top of that, like uh, what do you call logging, uh, it could exactly. be security, it could be something different. Exactly. So, uh, let's look at one component. Uh, let's look at API gateway. So what is its functionality uh, in a backend system? Uh, it's the first point at which the client does talks functionally. And all it needs to do is to have a validation of the coming input request if it's valid and then pass it on to the performance of the you know the core layer to it so that they can do the process so i believe like that's the good and segregated part i think uh, api layer should be holding it's called rate limiting as you have specified uh, specified rate limiting in this conversation 
uh, what is the functionality of rate limiter? Oh, uh, okay. So I believe there are couple of things in which uh, rate limiting can be used. A uh, couple of like I think like majorly I can divide it in two, and then they can be subdivided. So one is that uh, if I do have a rate limiter, uh, it does prevents us from say DDoS attacks. So that is the security perspective. So that your internal resources does not get burned out. And another one is that it does provides out more of like a feature flagging as well, or the resource limitations. So that one, uh, so let's say that if you have a user and it's having a specific limit of feature that you have allowed to that specific user. So with the rate limiter, we can limit that uh, that feature usage from them as well on an API okay, so, layer as well. So can you give me an example? Um, okay, so let's say that, you know, so let's say that for the DDoS attack. So what I do understand is that whenever I try to establish a, a TCP connection to, to my backend, what it does is that you do send out the request from the client and then you have a acknowledgement which which is received, right? So what happens is, so instead of that completing out that complete three-way handshake, uh, you start sending a lot of request to get connected to your backend so that your handshake is completed. Now what happens is that with that, the core layers or the underlying layers that we do have or the presence that we do have does get choked after a point of time. So let's say that if you do have a single instance, there are limited number of connections that you can make on a port after which the port chokes. And if I do have say a rate limiter or you know the IP table something like that it does prevents out or it keeps on checking on a specific basis that whether the incoming request that I do have is valid or not. So basically uh, an example uh, as far I can see is in a banking system a lot of people can attack on a bank so that they can get money out of it right. So yeah. you can. Uh, banks actually limit the number of login requests to three. After three attempts are made, the user is not allowed to log. That is true. So, uh, what does the bank, bank do? It just limits you to three. That is the rate limiter. After that, just cuts off all the operations. Or else, people are going to just send like thousands of requests, and then all of a sudden, the bank servers are going to crash. Completely and then, vulnerability is going to happen and then maybe someone can access some data and then take off the money right yes so uh i want you to design a system which is like a bank it's going to be like a bank uh but this is a book bank it's like a library but uh you can buy books okay you can lend books and okay so there are users which have not logged in not logged in users yeah also the not so logged in users they can't download the pdf they, are, they can view the pdf they can read it but only up to three books per day download the pdf just reading is wait for them just reading is allowed. Okay. And maximum of three in 24 hours? Yeah. Okay. Uh, They're going to log in, but they can rent based on their plan. Okay. They can download it? No, they can't download it. They can rent it. Renting okay. means they can view all the books, but maybe download like one book, one or two books. Let's say two books. Two books they can download it per day. And download two books in 24 hours. Okay. Okay. Uh, and do they have like a reading limit as well? No, they don't have a reading limit. They can read as much as they want. Got it. Unlimited 
and the third one we we'll call it as premium where the user can read download whatever they want to do so this might sound like we are designing kindles book bank and all uh, so in kindle you can actually read some of the titles if you log them you can download like small samples around and in kindle unlimited you can actually buy the entire book like you can get multiple books without any problem right got it okay so we have a small difference from that plan i'm actually going to build up more into this product while we are going to design this so got it okay yeah. so the way that i do understand this one is not just like a API rate limiter, right? It's working more as a rate limiting system for the users that I do have. Yeah. Uh, also, you have to design the API uh, API uh, rate limiter as well. Uh, we'll get down to that. First, we have to design this. Got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so these are the requirements that I do hold. So function, I, I can call them as the functional requirements, right? Because those yes. are the specific ways. Functional requirements. And then so the first, if it download PDF, it's not a valid one, but yeah, apart from that, everything else is fine. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just like write it down as the type of users that I have. So uh, I do have a question on the non-functional requirement at what scale uh, we are thinking to, you know, make this system. So initially I can say that we can start off with a small instance, but over the time, the plan that we have for this. So why I'm asking this is that uh, if I do have like a, a business requirement, I know which will not be like drastically scalable. Uh, I can have something, let's say, stateful service. But if I do want to like expand it very much, I believe they can be processing types, processing units, which can handle these requests. And then I can have, I can make them like stateless or try to put the data of the number of users, how many it's, it's like using in 24 hours uh, into a separate instance or a container. Which one do you think is better? So I believe like we can start off with a, a stateful service and then we can point like keep a point of discussion that, you know, if I wish to create it into a stateless service, that should be possible as well. Okay. So if it's a stateful service, what are the different advantages? Can you also write it down? Sure. Sure. Stateful and then making it to stateless. So with stateful, I do understand that, you know, a few of the benefits are that I can keep the data within the instance. And uh, so the, like that thing of getting the value from a different instance, that latency will not be there. It, uh, it will be much more, I believe initially a very simpler code, uh, to get. And then in stateless, it can be more of like a robust one. So let's say, um, if I'm hold, uh, so got so in stateless, it will be like easy to code, less latency. Although latency would more of be a decision that where do I wish to keep the data instances? And in stateless, it would be better. I believe like it would be a better one if. I have something as say, uh, yeah. So in stateless, it would be much more better that the processing unit that I do hold, uh, if any one of those, let's say that I have three to four replicas and in that one of them does goes down. It can be like, you know, any of the reason of the fault tolerance. So if any one of those goes down, I can still be having the value of how many times a user has done it? Like how many times a user has consumed according to their daily limits? So I believe like that is one of the main advantage I get with stateless service. 
this is my understanding that I how I think I should start designing it in that sense. Sounds reasonable. So, uh, yeah, how would you design this? Like okay. Design. Okay. Uh, Got it. In in this, it's more of like the rate limiting that you have. Oh yes, I do have a question. So as you have said that you know in one day or twenty four hours, I have let's say three maximum downloads. So shall I start counting twenty four as midnight zero or time since like the first book is downloaded? So what do you think? Which one would be better? I mean, 24 hours starting from midnight is a easier one to pull off since so, let's say I can yeah. have a restart as all of them as 24 midnight and another one I do need to keep a counter of let's say, you know, a retire policy or something like that and then it gets restart. So a user who wants to read three books, uh, they start reading at 11 p.m. Exactly. They complete one book and then they're only left with three more books. So yeah, you're right. You should uh, not limit it to midnight. Oh, okay. sorry, you should limit it to midnight. Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to? Okay. Cool. So this is. Okay. So uh, in this Gotham, I do understand that this is more of a a core component not just a rate limiting component of the api layer okay so gotham as you said that uh, the restart of the clock so do you want it to be uh, happening all for the same like all for the three decisions that we do have uh no i think we should be working on three or uh, maybe potentially more rate limiting options yes so Big I want you to tell me what would be the better approach for this. I do think that, uh, so let's say that it can be assigned according to the different users we have. One way that I do think is that if I do have like a non logged in user and if I'm just giving him a limit of like a say three reads in 24 hours, I can simply reset that one clock. Okay. But okay. I do believe like, let's say that a logged in user is there and then if he is feeling that you know within 24 hours my clock just got reset and then uh, i believe in that it should be a 24 hour clock window starting from the time that they have downloaded a two books like downloaded a book if this limit limit does increases uh it will not be a very good experience by the user as well And let's say that, you know, uh, going forward, if we wish to implement like a premium in premium, if we do wish to limit out some books, uh, that should also be handled wisely, not just in a midnight 24 recent. Uh, let's take premium as like not really limited, like people can go. But the thing is, uh, they should not be able to download like multiple books within like two, three minutes because that exactly. means that they will book and then publish it so. yes yes and so they, they should be like actually so they are allowed to download like there are two points i believe in this so one is that how much do i call unlimited let's say a thousand books in 24 hours is an unlimited for me i can call it that yeah you can see so actually not like make it 100 we don't want to sync hmm. Our business sure so 100 books downloads in 24 r calling it like you know we can call that as an unli unlimited because yeah. if we don't put like a barrier of unlimited then people can just you know drain our resources completely yeah they will just test out or by downloading all the books and then just publish it everywhere exactly exactly and then the other point uh, that i was having with this was so uh you said that the non-logged in user has to be rate limited right yes uh so 
there is a decision I would like to take. We are not going to make it till midnight. Instead, we are going to make it from the first time they download the book. And then up to 24 hours, they can't download more than two books. Okay, okay. So, yeah, I, I, I think that also doesn't work because in a business use case, they can just download two books by last two minutes. Sorry, read two books by last two minutes and then they will be they not feel it better. Yeah, you write, um, you're right about the clock starts at midnight and then it goes from that. Got yeah. it. Clock starts, uh, clock starts when first book is downloaded, right? Uh, no, no. Starts from midnight. From midnight for non-logged in users. Got it. Okay. Okay, unlimited read as well. So we say that 100 books is uh, downloads in 24 hours is unlimited. I believe we are hinting, you know, taking that 100 books reads also is unlimited in 24 hours. Let's keep a cap with that as well. Yeah, I don't think someone is going to read that quickly. But yeah, let's take like that. Uh, for the logout in user, what is the strategy you're thinking? Can you write it down? Uh, I'm I'm thinking it more of to be like uh, so when clock starts, I start out the clock for them. Is it for the download or for the read? What so for the... the for the, yeah, uh, I believe like that can be made for both. Both of the decisions can hold out the same. So at as soon as like their first reads get started, I can start that clock. And as soon as their first book, so let's say that they have just two books for now and we do increase. So two is a very small number for now. But as soon as their first books get downloaded, we can start out the cycle, uh, which, you know, gets reset in the coming 24 hours for them. I, I do believe like there are the complete scenario is happening within the first layer that I discussed, you know, uh, the load balancer and those kind of layers. So I do have, let's say, a client. And I do have my API gateways. Okay. And I do have load balancer. Load balancer, let's call it like simply a gateway. Gateway and LB. Okay. Now, this one is the API gateway in which all the handling is done. And let's say that I do have my rate limiter here now with and this is the client now with this i do believe like there are few cases in which uh the working of this guy will be happening before it is handled inside the api gateway and few of them are uh, would be handling inside like after once the the request is received after um, by the gateway yeah, I mean by that is, for example, the the counts of unlimited, those kind of things can be, so for example, let's say logged in and then I do have an unlimited read limit that is actually a hundred one, right? So those kind of requests, I can check that this specific guy, uh, how many counts it has made so that I can just drop it off directly in between, let's say here. So this will be just one component but it will be playing out its value in two different places so one is that it will be playing before it gets absorbed inside the api gateway and one is that during let's say that i have accepted a request then i'm pruning out the request but it is okay. a simple instance for understanding purposes i've written it down into two, two different places okay so Okay, I am able to understand. So there is this one question: how, how do you actually manage to find out which ones are logged in users and which are not? How do you do that? So one way with uh, logged in users is that when they are logged in, I do have a ID for them, like a user ID. So if I do have that, that way I can easily determine that you know this is a logged in source, uh, customer. Yeah, that is the easiest case. Like, what are 
what about non logged in so, so uh, if i don't have like so one way is that uh, in my api if i don't have those kind of things i can say that uh, this is a, a non logged in user another way that i think i can determine is that if i do have a cookie or an ip tracking with that uh, and then my cookie does says that you know this is the information that how many times this guy has pinged me before or uh, yeah in the in so the the processing of stating that this is not a logged in user is uh through the user id if i do have in my api and the way of a non logged in user is that it will not be having it and with my cookies or ip tracking i can say that how many times this guy has visited us so basically the client has to supply you the user id every time don't you think that is a vulnerability in logged in yes i was thinking in that way so you can use cookies for both of them so why not use it for both got it okay yeah so much more wait, what, that that will be for the authentication so how do you actually manage to put the cookies for non logged user so what is the entire flow if it is ip tracking then what is the flow because for example whenever you are logging into one ip uh, so uh, you are in a internet you can do a public ip and the thing is there are a lot of people who are connected to that same public ip right so what if coincidentally there are like 100 people who are connected to the same ip and because of that you are not able to read your books Okay, yeah, that does make sense. So with that uh, issue can happen if I just try to do it with API, no, sorry, uh, IP rate limiting. So I believe for each and every system that I do have, it would be much more better if I do have a cookie system, right? And yeah, so with give cookies because you're not logging in the person with So what is the strategy? Oh, okay. So in that, I'm I'm completely not aware of, you know, not getting logged in and then making out the cookie service. I do understand that it will be containing out the information to a specific node that I have requested, and then creating out, let's say, a hash of, you know, through which I can recognize each of the different node that I have in it. Uh, but if you would like to like tell me, that would be really helpful. Yeah, uh, I think I can explain it to you a little uh, bit. It will be a little vague, but whenever you are accessing a website, you, you uh, so sometimes what happens is that you go to this website, they will redirect you to another client where they will supply the cookie. They will give all the cookies uh, and then all the details and everything, and then it will redirect back to the original website so the website the prerequisite to getting to that website is that if you don't have the cookies for that website it will get you a cookie and then only it will allow you to go to the main page so by doing that you will actually slow down the entire process if there is a automated attack for example a system wants to get access to this wants to read everything and just uh, compile it and send it off so what ends up happening is that that will redirect it to a place where there is a cookie and they will give the cookie to the browser and then it will redirect back to the home page now by by doing that because this cookie is unique you will get to read up to three books after that what can the system do it can just delete the cookie and try to do it again but then it will redirect it back to the website and then do it so the one good thing about this is that you will have two types of cookie one will be for the website and the other one you got it from the redirected and using that cookie you can uh, map it to the ip and then somehow get the uh, unique identifier and then you basically slow down the hacking process got it okay so just to clear it out so in this cookie which is given to me uh for example that one way is that in my backend 
Oh, and we are considering for the non logged in users in this case only. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say that I do have a cookie. So in that the information that how many times the read has happened or the download or any of those information, I will be storing that inside the cookie, which does expires after a certain point of time instead of me storing out the information for a non logged in user in my backend. You mean that? Uh, yeah, but we don't actually store the how many, uh, the number of times we read because that can also be uh, what do you call it, modified by the client. So we store it in the backend itself for each cookie, like cookie address. Got it. Okay, so it will be more of like I do have a, a cookie, and then with this cookie in my backend, I'm storing the value of let's say the cookie is like x xv, and in this I do have xv has tried let's say two times in the twenty four hours, something like yeah. this. That will be in the back. Got it. Okay. Yeah. This is the back. Client. Okay, got it. Okay, yeah, that that makes much more sense now. Thank you so much for uh, telling me that flow. So that is like the one way in which I believe the non-logging ones can be handled. And since we are talking about the non-logging ones, I believe like this is a good time to even talk about the DDoS attacks ones as well. Yeah. So and this flow can like directly hand directly works in the case of we have few of the cases in which uh, the logged in one are trying to do the same. So uh, in this one, it is more working same as like there's a component in Linux known as the IP tables. And that is one way in which the DDoS attack can be prevented. And that is that when you do have an incoming request, uh, from a certain sources which you do wish to block you can block out those specific ones or in the one in which you can say that you feel that it's an empty request that you're getting and at the rate that which you're getting it you can put its behavior that it go goes out to an empty empty path instead of actually going to an a uh, api gateway so more of like let's say that if i do have a component something as an IP table here what happens is that the request does comes to here and then IP table verifies it that you know let's say that it does flags it out that it's an empty uh, empty request and it's happening at a very fast rate it does blocks you know it does sends it out to this black box instead of actually redirecting it to my API gateway so in that specific way, it can be handled uh, and inside our component as well, we can, I think, leverage out those API tables using those wrappers. And in that way, other DDoS attacks can be prevented. Yeah, so that is one way we can do that. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about, uh, so can I just like for a minute, I can just lock down everything that we have done for the non logged in users. Yeah, uh, that's a really good practice to have. Uh, so yeah, go on. That that's going to uh, help me go through the entire interview experience. I'll just screenshot this, and uh, I might be able to like, yeah. remember all the points that you have made, so that I can judge you better. So the cookie thing also helps with the DDoS attack because yes, there might be ten requests per second. Let's take a case of 10 requests per second, and it takes two seconds for the entire cookie to be generated and given to the user. So when you are given to the user, even before deleting the cookie, if there is another request, it will find out that, yeah, this has already, there is a cookie, but they are trying to do multiple uh, requests all together. So that is a way you can just find out that this is a DDoS attack and then uh, slow down. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So these are like the point of discussions that we had so far. I believe now we can move on to the logged in users as well now. Yeah. So now we have download of two books in 24 hours, unlimited read that is 100. 
uh, first time it downloads or reads that does takes place okay so in this uh, it can be more working as the following way i do think so this is the time when the request from the first layer of api read limiting like you know the ddos attack and those kind of things is done but uh, yeah we do need to take care of that so now this is the uh, gateway that we have from the api and now it does can make like two types of request one is of download and one is of read okay and with this let's say that i do have a small object and considering that we are using cookie as or the user id uh, let's say user id for this case since now because i do have a user id for the logged in user okay yeah. against a user id whenever the first download starts i can keep a counter or an object in which does keeps a load of uh, how many books are downloaded so as soon as like i do have a request i make it one and then i can have its expiry as like 24 hours okay same goes for the number of books that i have read and then it can hold like you know one and then one can get to two three four let's say 50 till 100 and then this object this object gets expired or restart in 24 hours as well okay and then let's say that if the, this one does reaches 100 and it's continuously trying on at a very rate so that the first layer that i was holding for the rate limiting one that can block it or i can you know start marking it out as block from here as well if i do see that it's making like a very high amount of request in a very slow rate as well this is one way that i'm thinking that this can be taken place and this is more of like you know in your in your in memory data because this does get read out and this is not more of a persistent knowledge that i do need to keep for the instance so i can keep so, this value in uh, in memory data yeah so you're going to have like 100 different objects so that you can like you have some kind of expiry and then you deal with that is it like that or with a user yes i was thinking like the number of users that have actively pinged me right now uh i can have their counts at that time so don't you think this is going to be a bottleneck sort of okay oh uh, this can be a bottleneck let's say that of all of my users are making that count you mean to say that and then I will, I'll be having all of their data in, uh, in memory. Yeah, it, I'm sort of, yes. Okay. So then in that case, let's say that if I, okay, considering that I was having an expiry window in less time and the, here it's more of like a 24 hour, uh, I can take then a decision that I can persist this object or this information inside my persisted DB as well. Yeah, but then there is this 24 hour uh, expiry, right? Yes. So, is it going to be expired by themselves or are we going to evict it? No, no, it gets like expired by themselves. So, the object more of like restarts. Okay, uh, I think that would be a very slow process, but can you explain it to me like how that can be optimized? Um. Okay, uh, optimized in that sense. So, the one way is that I can do keep the values in memory and then within a 24 hour, uh, yeah. So, let's see it in this way. If I'm trying to keep it in any one of the object, okay, I do have two ways that it can actually expire. One is that it reaches out the 24 hour limit, and then another one. I simply have a tag that it has reached a limit of let's say two downloads and then this one is already done. There cannot be a scope of change in this case. How about we do it through a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, a queue system. How about that? A queue system where? 
So you have a queue. Okay. Every time a user requests for it, you put it in a queue. You push it. Till uh, at one end of the queue, what you do is, if there is any uh, download which has gone past 24 hours, we just delete it. And we update that user's count to minus. Whenever there is a request, you add it, which has been uh, fulfilled. And by the end of it, if the last one is, has completed 24 hours, you just evict it as soon as possible. You go like that. Okay, so you mean like as soon as I do reach out the limit of 24, I do evict it. No, not 24, like the upper limit of number of downloads that are allowed on this object. I evict it. Yeah. Yes. So, in a way, that cube system will make sure that if there is a excess of data, which like users which are uh, using it, the queue itself will limit it. On top of that, there will be a layer which will be for the user, but they, their count of how many they have requested in 24 hours is already a number. Yeah, yeah, that does make sense. Yes. Um, but in a queuing, queuing system as well, the object will still be persisted when they are not inside the queue, right? Yeah, you can do some cron job or something like every 10, 20 minutes, maybe just to delete maybe the ones. Uh, but yeah. Cool. Okay, so the queuing systems, like I, as you said, is also one of the options. Um, I believe we can work with that. Now, yeah. shall we discuss or like about the premium, uh, premium customers as well? Uh, yeah. So, do you think that it's going to be similar, or is it going to be anything that is uh, that you have to implement on top of this? No, I do think so. That it it is a similar one. So, according to the okay, according to the user ID that I do hold, I can get the information that when whether it's a premium one or uh, a normal logged in one. And on top of that, I can make out the same uh, decisions on top of it. It's just that in this specific case, whenever I'm handling like a premium customer, uh, my queue will be handling in a case that for this specific object, this is the eviction policy that I do hold. Okay. Yeah, I believe like that. That's how, you know, these things can make sense. So, and now if you wish to move towards non-functional requirements, uh, it can be more of, as I said, the queue and the, let's say, any of the in-memory or the user-related information that I do hold, it can be more of like within a complete in a instance that I do have. Like this, it will be having my rate limiter. Okay. Uh, the API handlers and the data that is related to it. Data for rate limiter. Okay. So within a container, I'm containing all of these three objects. But in the case of, let's say that if I wish to make it forward ahead, a stateless service, what I can do is that the data for the rate limiter which is present just for this one I can take it out I can have like let's say a separate container and in that I am holding out these this information okay. and each time we do have let's say a case in which it does needs to uh, work with the different ones this guy can ping this specific component and then get the value which is present for this and this one can be working as like one of the instance which is only a uh, kind of so all of its replicas are mainly responsible for the in-memory data and not the api handlers or those kind of things so we can accordingly provide much more processing and uh, more memory information to it as well okay this is my understanding for the non-functional requirements that is needed for this project. Great, great. Uh, I think we have discussed about all the utilities. 
find new strategies to crack the interviews. Yes, and these kind of discussions are much more important as like not just I believe for the interview, but it also helps you think that in a specific way a problem can be solved. Let's say that uh, I was thinking to solve the problem in a eviction of an object when the 24 hour gets over. And then Gotham gave an idea of let's how about use a queuing, queuing system. And then let's say one of our viewers will be viewing us and then they say that you know they can come up with a better system design approach than that and it would be awesome to have. And that's how I believe great uh, designs are evolved by having those discussions. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that does make so much sense. So thank you so much guys. Thank you so much uh, for your time today. Uh, please do reach out to us and this is it for this time. Thank you for watching prompt. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye bye.